going to be a good day. And uh, I, I just really felt strong. First service was really, really strong presence of God. And if you're, uh, if you're brand new to our church, maybe you're atheist, agnostic, maybe your mom invited you to come today and you're like, all right, mom, here's your gift for the year. Uh, maybe girlfriend, boyfriend said, I'm going to break up with you unless you go to church with me today. <laughs> Welcome to church. But we're glad you're here. I don't know what brought you here, but I do know this, that God is good at getting our attention when we open our heart. And if you're going to be here, let's just open our hearts up. Who's up for opening your heart a little bit? And um, he doesn't need a lot of space. He just needs a little bit of space. So uh, if you're brand new today, I'm going to open the Bible. We're starting a new series called First. Every January, we do a series called First. And uh, I want to focus every year. It's, it, it, it begs repeating every year that it's so significant that God is not only the end, but he is the beginning. He's the alpha and the omega. And there's something very special to God when it comes to origins. The genesis of our seasons the genesis of our life, there's something powerful whenever the people of God give God the first. God has always designated the significance of the first to have the power to bless the rest. 10% has always had the ability to take care of the 90%. And that's why even when uh, Isaac traveled to find a wife for his son, it's crazy. When a servant went, he brought 10%, brought 10 animals. 10 always represented the whole. And so when we give God the first 10, we give God the beginning, the first month of the year, January, God has the power to take care of the rest of it. And so uh, first, and so we do first conference every year, and every year people go like, this is this church's first conference? And we're like, no, it's our third conference, but we call it first conference. Church one day is going to be 20 years old doing first conference. But um, I'm excited. Uh, if you're brand new today, we're going to open up God's word. I do believe in a God that speaks. I believe that it's not weird to hear God's voice. It's weird to be a Christian and not believe that you hear God's voice. Jesus said, my sheep shall know my I want you to know that hearing the voice of your Father in heaven is the birthright of every believer. And sometimes when you hear his voice, you feel corrected. Sometimes you, you hear his voice, you feel directed. And sometimes he speaks to you and he inspires you. Can we all agree that we want to hear his voice today? So the primary way God speaks is through his written word. FYI, that is why there's always been such a great attack on the written word of God. Because if the devil can talk you into what God has and hasn't said, he can get you into sin. That was the original fall of humanity was questioning God's validity in his word. Are you with me today? So I'm trying to be too serious up top. I have some jokes for you. Who has a sense of humor today? If you don't, you're dismissed. I'm just kidding. Uh, you stick around. We're going to have a good time, though. I want to read 12 verses out of Luke chapter 2. We've been in Luke 2 pretty much all of December. We talked about Jesus being a baby for Christmas. We talked about Jesus being a toddler when the wise men came from the east. And today, we're going to look at the last glimpse of Jesus' young life before he becomes a full-grown 30-year-old adult starting a ministry. We have one snapshot of Jesus as a teenager. It's in Luke chapter 2. He's 12 years old. 12 years old. And we're going to read about Jesus at the age of 12 years old. I'm going to read 12 verses. I'm going to pray. I'm going to tell a story or two. And I have five ideas I felt like God was inspiring with me with to declare over California, to declare over Orange County, to declare over this church, and to declare over all of our personal lives. Are you guys ready to go? I need you to lean in a little bit. Pretend you're at your favorite movie for a second. Come on. We get more excited for a Netflix show than we do about the presence of God. We're going to lean in a little bit today. Y'all ready? And what we're going to do, we're going to stir our faith up. Let's read Luke chapter 2, verse 40. Uh, chapter 2, verse 40 and following. It says, the child Jesus grew and he became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Who says that'd be a good prayer for Ocean's Church? That we would grow and become strong in spirit, that we'd be filled with wisdom, and the grace of God would be upon us. I believe this is prophetic. I believe verse 52 is for us this year as well. Let's keep reading. His parents went to Jerusalem every year. How many years? Every year. Mom and dad, look up for just for a second. The greatest gift you can give your kids. It's not a car. It's not a college education. The greatest gift parents give their kids is a godly example. A love for Jesus and a love for his house. Mom and dad, worst thing you can do for your kids is talk bad about God and talk bad about his church. Passover, they came every year, it was a feast, Deuteronomy 16, 16 says, every year families are supposed to travel to Jerusalem, men are supposed to go three times a year, so they went annually, and when, they, when, he, when Jesus was 12 years old, how old? 
He was 12. He was a preteen. He went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. And when they had finished the days as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered. What did he do? He lingered behind in Jerusalem, and incidentally, it was in the church. I want you to know that, that your teenager wasn't the first one to linger. And if there was ever a place that we want our kids to linger in, it's the house of God. It says this, and so supposing that Jesus was with them in the company, they went a day's journey. In those days, families would travel in convoys. Many people, multiple families from the villages would travel together. So they thought they supposed that he was with one of the other families, with the relatives. And so they sought him amongst their relatives. They sought him amongst their acquaintances, but they did not find him. So they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. So they traveled one day without God. They traveled one day back to where God was, and it took them another day because it says the third day, after three days, they found him in the temple. Yes. Where they find him? In the church. Yes. Where was God found? The church. In the church, sitting amongst the teachers, both listening and asking questions. Listening and asking questions. I believe that we got to be like Jesus, found in the church, listening and asking questions. This is how we grow in stature. This is how we grow in wisdom. This is how we grow in God's grace. So watch what it says here. And it says, he was doing those things, and all who heard him were astonished at his answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said, son, why have you done this to us? Your father and I sought you anxiously. Why have you done this to us? Any parents in here ever said that to their kids? Don't raise your hands. Why'd you do this to us? And it says, it says that Jesus, his response, but that word, by the way, they were anxious. It wasn't just anxious. It was like they were sorrowful. Wow. They, were, they, were, they, they thought the worst. They thought he was dead. They thought that they lost God. Wow. So they, they were anxious. And Jesus responds very calmly. He says, why did you seek me? Did you not know yes. that I must? Say it with me, must. Yes. This could be a musty message today. I'm going to tell you. That I must be about my father's business. They didn't understand the statement that he said to them. And when they went afterwards, then Jesus went down with them and came to their hometown of Nazareth. Was subject to them and his mother kept all these things in her heart. Jesus, like Ocean's Church, increased in wisdom, stature, and favor with God and with men. I don't know what's going to happen economically, politically this year, but I do know is that the people of God can increase in wisdom, in stature, and in favor with both God and with men. Here's what God told me, and I'll pray. God told me this week that this was going to be a year that he's calling the church to come home. He wants the people of God to bring him home. I believe that cities, states, and nations are only as strong as the family units. And if we are Christians that only visit God on Sundays and we don't bring them home Monday through Saturdays, we're going to have weak civilizations. This is the hour, this is the time that we bring God, say with me, home. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We honor you. We ask you that you would bless today. Let your sweet presence fill these tents online. I just thank you that you'd meet us right where we are. We pray for more championships in the city of Los Angeles. In Jesus' name and God's people said... Everybody sit. I, uh, on, a, on a more humorous note, I've realized the older that a person gets, the more selective you have to be with what you bring back home. Any young bachelors will know and tell you that they don't own any furniture that they paid for themselves. I've been a young man before. All of my first furniture in my first place was either given to me by someone that pre-owned it or it was on a sidewalk with a paper sign that said free. When you're single, you show up at home, you bring couches home. Where did that come from? I found it on a sidewalk. Strapped it on my VW Golf. It's going in my living room. Lamps, side tables, televisions. Oh, yeah, you better believe, man. When people were getting rid of the tube televisions, I had like 16 in my bedroom. It's free, baby. Just scooping it up. I've always been, I've always been uh, uh, I don't know, intrigued by the human condition to be impulsive. And it's funny because you get married and the stuff that you would bring home when you were single, your wife would not tolerate. Can we agree on that? 
Like, you were happy to bring food home. Like, your, mom, your wife's like, what are you bringing home jack-in-the-box tacos for? I'm like, I'm a Christian, right? That's, right? I was thinking about bringing, bringing things home. It was funny. I was thinking about, you know, just even, um, I, I, even the business, you know, people in business, they, they play on the impulsive nature of humanity. And I was thinking, man, what boardroom meeting, would have, what would it like, what was it like, the first boardroom meeting, that they pitched the idea of someone carrying a cardboard sign yeah. with a Walkman yeah. dancing on a busy street corner yeah. peddling pizza? I just only imagine they're in a meeting and they're like, hey, we got to get some sales up this year for Little Caesars. And Jim in the corner is like, I got an idea. We're going to get a cardboard sign. It's going to say $5 hot and ready. We're going to get a 17-year-old. We're going to hype him up on sugar. We're going to put a Walkman in his ears and he's going to be dancing like David. Come on. And this guy is going to shake his little cardboard sign and people are going to see it and they're going to drive in. 100% worked. Impulsive things that you bring home. I've always wondered, though, why in the world did the mattress guy think that it would work for them like it worked for Little Caesars? You ever seen those mattress? But I don't know why we have so many mattress stores. Can we all agree on that? Something's not right. We don't need that many bets. But for some reason, every mattress store has someone they're paying outside shaking a sign saying, mattress sell. As though you're going to spontaneously. Mark, what are you doing? Well, that's a king-size bed on our VW Golf. It's a great sell. I saw it. Couldn't pass it up. Impulse. Bring it home. I've been amazed that there's some things you bring home that change your, hope, your house. A couple, couple months, about a month ago, we, 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 we got a dog. Some of you know. Keep the prayers coming, saints. But I remember the lady that actually gave us the dog, she said, I'm going to fly in. We're going to meet you at the airport at John Wayne, and then you're going to take the dog home. And I was with her until that last part. Take them home. Yeah. Have you ever noticed there's some things that you didn't know you needed until you brought it home? Yeah. Right. I'll never forget when our first child was born, Kenzie. I thought our life was complete. Yeah. I thought, man, I married the woman of my dreams. She's way better looking than I'd ever thought I'd marry. Come on. <laughs> way godlier than I ever deserved. And I'm like, man, my life is full. And then we had our first da daughter. And it was crazy. On the way to the hospital, I was driving like Dell Earnhardt Jr., on the way home, I was driving like Miss Daisy. Yeah. And it was crazy. It wasn't until I brought my child home that there was actually a vacancy I didn't know existed. And I felt the heart of God this year just compelling the church. And he told me to tell you this, that God's heart was that he, he wants you to know there's some things about you that aren't you until God's home. The phrase he gave me was that we are not us until he is welcome home in us. We are not the state that we need to be. We are not the county we need to be. We're not the parents we need to be. We're not the husbands and the wives that we need to be until Jesus is sitting at the Lord, the, the throne of our hearts and our lives. Humanity requires a relationship with God before it can fully be itself. Humanity requires a relationship with God before it can fully be itself. Many people don't realize, they're like, man, I thought my life was whole, it was complete. But you didn't know what you were missing until you brought them home. Mary and Joseph were the first human beings to meet God at church, but to leave God at church. They were the first ones to go to church with God and leave the church without him. They started going home without God. And they realized that something was off, something was missing, and something was worth returning for. And the story of Luke chapter 2 was the power and the significance of knowing when God isn't with you, where to go to bring him back. They found him in the temple. They found him amongst the teachers, the preachers. They found him in an atmosphere of faith. And I believe that this year, what we need in our counties, what we need in our neighborhoods, what we need in our governments, what we need, are you hearing me? From the White House to the crack house, is we got to bring Jesus back home. we got to bring him back. There's vacancies in our land. Moral depravity running rampant. Babylonian mentalities that are being indoctrinated to our kids. And I tell you what, the, the world is, 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 is going to drift away and float away until the church discovers who is the Lord of the land. We, we are of the persuasion that there is a God that's worth bringing to our homes. 
says that when, when these things happen, it says that Jesus grew physically, mentally, socially, spiritually. He got strong in spirit. He got filled with wisdom. The grace of God was upon him. When? When, when people came and brought him home. And I believe it still happens today that we grow socially. We grow mentally, physically, spiritually when we bring God home. It's crazy. January 1, we're watching the ball drop. We got goals to get that six-pack uh, uh, excavated from our keg. You see people right now at every beach. The beaches are crowded. Not of people in the water, but running on the beach. I went, it was like a Tybo gym. Sam Clemente the other day. People doing insanity at the beach. People running with their shirts off. Keep it on, homie. You're close. It's crazy. Gyms are at capacity. Everybody's trying to get back into shape. Everybody's buying Dave Ramsey books. We're getting a, f a whole money makeover. Let's buy this curriculum with a credit card. Everybody's prioritizing. This is the year financially we get back. This is the year that we get our business back, our marriage back, our romance back. This is when we're getting our bodies back. But very, very few people make a priority. What is the first thing we got to get back? We got to get God back on the throne. And until God is who we trust, I'm telling you, what you trust in is weak. Some trust in chariots, others in horses. There's no security until we trust in the name. And I was praying, I was, I was just praying, I just felt this so strong this week that, that God was doing something in our, in our land, in our state, that God wanted us to bring him home to our houses. He wants us to bring him home to our families. He wants our kids to see us reading our Bibles. He wants our kids to see us praying. He wants to see us raising our kids up in the things of God. Well, I don't believe in indoctrinating my kids. You don't? You do with your San Francisco 49ers nonsense. You do with your, come on, Philadelphia Eagles demonic stuff. So why would you not lead your kids, disciple your kids in the God that they should bow to? Listen, if I was the devil, you know what I would tell people? Don't show your kids the way they should go. Because the Bible says to raise your kids up in the way that they should go. So that when they're older, they won't depart from it. People are departing because they were never taught at home. We got to bring God front, center, home. Why do we know that people weren't, weren't home? What, they didn't bring them home is, is number one, if you're taking notes, I believe it's very possible. Mary and Joseph prophetically show us that it's quite possible to actually take, start your trip, start your year, plan your year, and not ask the question, is Jesus with us? I believe the human proclivity is to make decisions and make plans and afterwards ask God to bless them. Instead of asking God, what are you blessing? What is your dream? What is your path? Where are you wanting to go? That's where I'll go. As Americans, we have a proclivity of going, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send it, and I pray afterwards that you heal me. I don't want to send it and then pray for mercy. I want to ask God for his grace to guide my life. I want his words to be a lamp unto my feet and a light into my path. Can I get an Amen. And many times we miss God because we, there's a strong contrast here between Jesus is actually, uh, their parents are in agony because they lost God for three days. They lost him at church. They left him at church. And when they left him at church, here's the irony. is Mary and Joseph, they're in agony for three full days. Not the last time they'd be in agony for three days. But three full days, they're in agony. And it says that when she shows up, she says, how could you do this to us? When the reality is, Jesus could have said, uh, no, you should be saying, how could we do this to you? He's a 12-year-old boy. Come on, parents. But this is the human condition that when we get off a of track in life, oftentimes we blame God and we say, how could you do this to us? Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived, said, foolish men ruin their lives and then blame God for it. How could you do this to us? And the question is, and that is, Lord, forgive me for doing this to you. And Mary, she, she misses out on this idea. She says, how could you do this to us? Jesus accepts no blame. He, issues a, he actually issues a gentle rebuke. He says, no, I've been busy um, myself with my father's business. Mary's like, you freaked me and your, your, and your dad out. He's like, no, I've actually been about my father's business. And it's interesting because the word 
uh, I must be about my father's business. It carries with the idea a necessity, just like Luke, Luke 24, when two disciples are in agony after three days of Jesus being crucified and buried, and they thought there was no hope that God was lost forever. And Jesus appears on the road to Emmaus after three days of agony and appears to them the very similar way that he appeared to his mom and his earthly father saying, hey, it was necessary that the Son of Man must fulfill the law, fulfill. And starting with Moses, he exegeted who he was in Scripture. And I believe that God is still doing this today, that he wants to remind humanity that oftentimes we don't leave God. Or God doesn't leave us. We lead him. And if we want to make sure this is our best year we've ever lived, most intentional, strategic, most God-honoring year of our life, we have to be like Mary. Instead of saying, why did you leave us? We have to make a decision to say, God, forgive me for leaving you. I want to bring you home. I want to bring you home. And when they make the decision to bring him home, they found him out of 70, 80,000 people in Jerusalem. They find him in the church. They find him in the church. And I believe this, that what we do, if we're going to be a church that brings God fully into our lives, into our families, marriages, our children, our businesses, our our dreams, our desires, our destinies, we have to make a conscious decision, even today, first Sunday of the year, that his presence is our prize. It's his presence. North American Christianity oftentimes has been guilty of of, of creating a genie-like faith. That we pray a prayer, we touch the right buttons, and God gives us what we want out of the machine. And God is not a genie that goes, that, that, come on, poof, what do you need? Poof, what do you need? Can I call you Al or maybe just in? Come on. Tough crowd. I've learned this, that his presence is actually something that we can't take for granted. Note this, if Mary and Joseph, the earthly parents of Jesus, could forget where Jesus was, we can too. Here's what God told me. He said, Mark, maturity is the gap between how long it takes you to realize God isn't with you to returning to him. Maturity. Immature people go for like six months, six years. Didn't even realize God wasn't there anymore. It's going to church, didn't meet with him. Read my Bible, didn't connect with him. Was singing the song, not connecting with him. But mature Christians, they realize, man, when, there's, when he's not here, something's off. And when the, when the presence of God is the price... I'm telling you, it it changes everything. When he's the prize, like Mary and Joseph, when he's not there, when we realize, well, I don't think he's here today. I have to be ready, like Mary and Joseph, to hunt for him, to search for him, to pray for him, to search for him in the scriptures, to look for him in prayer, and to go after him in worship. Like Mary, like Joseph, we find him when we pursue his presence as the greatest prize. Putting Jesus on the throne and keeping him on the throne is a daily decision. I don't care if you've been a Christian for 40 years. Every day you make a decision, what is going to sit on the throne of your life? Paul says you got to die daily. Pick up your cross daily. Follow after me. So important that we got to be a church that prioritizes the presence of God. It's not what's in God's hand, Jack Hayford said. It's not what's in God's hand. It's in what's in God's heart that's the price. What good is a promised land without the promiser? What good is the blessing of God without the blesser? What good is deliverance without the deliverer? What good is the things of God without the person of God? Many people want salvation without the Savior. They want presence from God without the presence of God. But I believe that as a church, we want to bring God home to Orange County. We want to bring God home to Southern California. We want to be a church that honors God at such a high level that it begins to change the currents of our land. We have to make up our minds today to go, God, your presence is the price. It's better than houses, cars, and spouses. It is your presence that is the greatest prize of life. Churches that burn for God's presence are churches that change regions. You are the prize told Abraham, I am your shield. I am your buckler. I am your exceedingly great reward. We have some weird theologies out there today that say God doesn't want to bless you, take care of you. Listen to me. He says in Hebrews uh, that he who comes to God must believe. Must what? Right there, that weeds out dispensationalism. Must what? You know what's crazy? When theology doesn't require any faith, God doesn't heal anymore. God doesn't deliver addicts anymore. God doesn't change bodies anymore. God can't change your proclivities anymore. The way that you were born is the way that you have to die. Any theology that doesn't require faith does not please God. 
For he who comes to God must believe. Must what? Believe, believe that he is and that he is a. What does he like to do? Reward. Those that who? Diligently seek him. Where are those people that say in the beginning of this year, you mark my words, Lord, I'm going to diligently seek you. I'm going harder after you. I'm giving you more of the real estate of my life, my heart. God, so be it. Your presence is my greatest prize. And like Mary and Joseph, how do you get this prize back in place? When you discover that he's not there anymore, you got to return. You got to seek him and you find him. Three steps. Return, seek, find. It's crazy the word repent means to change your mind or change your direction. It means to return. Kind of a dirty word in our society today because those crazies that stand at sporting events with their signs and their microphones making the rest of us look weird. But I want you to know it's not yelling at people how bad they are that causes people to turn to God. The Bible I read says it's the goodness of God that leads men to change, to return. We're going to be a church that sees people return to seek him. Notice what happens in verse 44. It says that when he wasn't there, they sought him amongst their relatives. They sought him amongst their acquaintances, but he was not found. Notice this, ladies and gentlemen, that God is not found through other people. He's only found in direct access. God has no grandkids. God has no secondhand relationships. You know what's killing the church at times? Secondhand Christianity. People are trying to get high off of someone else's smoke. God wants you to have your own fire, not live in someone else's smoke. Can I get an amen in the church today? Too many people are like, my, my mom is devoted. I'm fine with God because my mom's devoted. My grandma, she prays every day. My grandpa was a pastor. Look, that's great, Jethro, but God wants you. Why are you settling for someone else's smoke? Christianity is the only thing on the earth that can't be accessed through somebody else. They went to mom and dad. They went to aunts and uncles. Is Jesus with you? They're like, no. They went to acquaintances. My business partner, he's such a godly man. Is Jesus with you? And he's like, yeah, but you can't get him through me. You got to go back to the temple. You got to go back to where he is and seek him. We don't access God through other people. We access God through him. Jesus said, I am the door. No one comes to the sheep except through me. Was he being literal? No. If he was literal, he'd be like, I am the mahogany door, right? He's saying figuratively that he is the door access point to all relationship with God. That's why I don't buy into the coexist sticker on the back of the Subaru. Come on. I know that we don't coexist because God isn't like all the other deities. He's not a little G. He's a big G. Can I get an Amen. The problem is we live in a time period that we got to submit to God, resist the devil. And the Bible says that we draw near to God, that he will draw near to us. Return, seek, find, bring God home. The problem is many times Christians lose their must. And I'm not talking about junior high locker rooms. I'm talking about when Jesus told his mom on earth, he said, why'd you look for me? Did you not know that I, that I, Everyone that did something great in life knew their must. John the Baptist said, I, he must increase. I must decrease. Jesus says, you don't put old wine in the old wineskins. You must put it in new wineskins. Jesus knew what his must was over and over again. He says, the scripture must be fulfilled. He said things like, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities. For this reason, I have come. Zacchaeus, he said, make haste, get down, little man, for I must come to your house tonight. Jesus knew his must. He told Nicodemus at night, hashtag Nick at night. He said, you must be born again. It's crazy. He knew what his must was. He says, God is spirit and he who worships him, the woman at the well, must worship him in spirit and in truth says that there's no salvation in any other name given under heaven in which men must be saved. The Philippian jailer, Acts 16, what must I do to be saved? Everyone that did something great with God or for God knew their must. Can I ask you, I know some of you are like, well, I must go back to the gym this week. Great. Where is your God must? Where is the God must? I, I, I got to know him this year. I want to hear his voice. Never fasted before. This is the month I fast. Never read my Bible before. This is the month I read. 
Never read it cover to cover. This is the year I do it. What is your must? And I believe that when you know your must, you start taking them home with you. Calling people back to God's house to discover Jesus. And when you discover Jesus, you will encounter him. And God's heart would be that you take him home with you. Notice Mary and Joseph didn't meet him at church and leave him at church. They brought him back to Nazareth. I felt God just impressing so, so heavily on me that it's time to bring him home. God's first. Can I get an amen? I'm almost finished. Come on, say it with me. Amen. God's first. He is, he is, he's, he's our, he's our, he's our home. He's, I don't know, I just feel like he's the medal of honor to our life. He's the reward worth competing for. He's the, he's the reward, the prize worth disciplining your life for. He's the focus of our schedule. He's the tailor of your convictions. He's the elevator of your standards. He's the organizer of your priorities. He's the lens in which we see life through. He's the authority on every topic. He's the owner of every detail. He's the object of all our affections. He's the rock in which we stand. His presence, his spirit, is the treasure that's found in a field. And for the joy over it is worth selling all that we have and buying that field. He is the pearl of great price. Are you hearing me? And when we realize that he is the king of the kingdom that's worth pursuing with all that we have, and we bring him home, it starts to change the way that we see life. It's crazy. Problem is we live in a dark world, an evil time, and we underestimate God and we overestimate evil. We don't see what God is doing and conclude that he is doing nothing. We see everything that evil is doing and think that it's in control of everyone. We must trust God's word which we don't see, not the limited and controlled evil that we do see. Can I get an amen? And I want you to know, to remind you today, that humanity re requires a relationship with God before it can be itself. Without God, hum hum human beings turn in on themselves. Neglecting God's word is the original sin. It's straight Satan's strategy. Has God said? Disregarding God's voice is where bondage always begins. Where did bondage start for you? It started when you disregarded God's voice. And I'll tell you, we live in a world that's anti-God because it's anti-fear of the Lord. And wherever there is an absence of the fear of the Lord, there will always be a vacuum of wisdom. How do you know we're, we're vacant of wisdom? Because if we find a microorganism on Mars, we have, we have life on the tabloids of every newspaper, but we have a ten-fingered, ten-toed heartbeat and lungs at eight months, and we say it's not life. We live in an anti-logic, anti-wisdom civilization. We, we believe these anti-Christian chants, my body, my choice. When the Bible I read says that you were bought at a price, that you are no longer your own, that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna say it today. I'm not trusting the science. They keep on pushing science on me. Science today can't tell the difference between male and female. I'm not trusting the science. We live in an anti-fear of the Lord civilization. It leads to anti-wisdom from the world, where humanity's morality is bankrupt, where purpose doesn't exist. Why is there so much suicide? Because if there's no God, there's no purpose. We live in a world that doesn't exist with purpose. Two plus two can be whatever you want it to be. Truth is relative. The Bible is hate speech. Right and wrong is subjective. Worship belongs to whatever your hands have built. And we have empty cities and empty civilizations that have more than we've ever had because God is not sitting on the throne. I'm telling you, too many of us spend far too much time in the editorial pages and not nearly enough time in God's prophetic words. We get our interpretations of politics, ethics, and economics and morals from corrupt, godless journalists, filmmakers, and professors. Those people can give us information, but the meaning of the world and the purpose and the lens of life is given to us from God's living, breathing word. Yeah. Creators reserve the right to name and write the manual for best practices. I take my Honda to the Honda dealership because they made it. And that, that manual has the right to tell me what's in and what's out with that car. What oil goes into it, what gas it takes, they reserve the right as the creator. 
And we live in an arrogant, anti-God society that says, no, we can tell God what the potter can do with the clay. Not the way it works. I got good news for you today. With God, it's never required the majority to deliver all. God only needed two spies out of 12. God only needed one senior citizen couple to start a new people group. He only needed one righteous family to build a boat that saved the world. He only needed one Hebrew girl and her uncle to prevent genocide in Israel. He only needed one scared Gideon to wither down an army from 32,000 to 300. We, we serve a God that takes five loaves and two fish and feeds 15,000. We see 500 saw him after the resurrection, 120 were in the upper room, and God turned Christianity, the world's foremost belief, from 120 to over 3 billion people on the earth. God has never needed everybody. He just needs some people to say, God, you're coming home with me. You are coming home with me. One of the most extraordinary aspects of the good news is that God can use bad men to accomplish his good purposes. God will leverage Nebuchadnezzar. God will, God will cause Haman to hang on his own gallows. The indictment of Sodom and Gomorrah wasn't that the city was so wicked. It was that the righteous were so few. If there was 10 righteous, God would have saved everybody. And I don't know about you. I know there's some wicked people in California, but I look around these tents and I see some righteous men and women. You're going to stand to your feet. Come on, everybody stand up to your feet. Let's give God a hand clap for who he is. If you're going to make God the God of your home this year, come on, give him a shout of praise. Feel a reverence of God, a willingness to invite God back in. The problem with some of you is you think that God is supposed to answer to you. He doesn't. God doesn't work for you. God doesn't report to you. You didn't make God in your image. You're made in His. And here's the problem with many of you. You'll never discover how good God is until you surrender to Him. Be an atheist your whole life talking about how evil God is. It's not until you surrender that you see His goodness. When you see his goodness, you soften your heart. And I, got, I feel bold today, but I want to remind you that you will bow at some point, willingly or unwillingly. And I want to remind you that if he is real, listen, some of you are planning more for your, your, your retirements, you're planning more for, for golfing and moving to Palm Desert one day than you are for eternity. If heaven is for real, it's worth taking serious. Can we agree on that today? I'm going to bring him home for the Lord's sake, let's bring them home. Let's bring God to our neighborhoods. Let's bring God, come on, seven days a week. Got my daughters, we're doing a little Bible study with our girls last night. Chloe's six, and she's memorizing two verses a week. Two verses a week, that's her assignment. My, my 13 year old and I, we're reading through Proverbs. My friend Pedro inspired me to do a challenge with my 13 year old. And we're reading through every chapter every day. She's writing down 10 things that she's taken away from Proverbs with wisdom and foolishness. We gotta show our kids the way. If you don't disciple your kids, someone else will. I'm telling you, Orange County is not gonna disciple my kids. I'm discipling my kids. Come on, you believe that today? Yeah. I feel like some of you, there's a few in here that you've, you've achieved high levels of success, but you feel like you've done it at the neglect of your family and your children. And God says that there is mercy and there is grace. And you watch this year, that not only will God continue to take care of your business, but God says, watch, as you make me the Lord of your home, as you bring me home, you start spending time with me every day, you watch how I mend the relationship with your wife, your husband. You watch how I bring your daughter and your son back online. I believe that God will restore the years the locusts have devoured. I believe that God will restore what was lost in the last season of life. Some of you lost a decade with your kids. God says, I will restore the years. Bring me home. Bring me home. Come on, Anthony, bring me home. Yeah, I feel it. Pedro, bring me home. Yeah, I feel it today, Lord. I pray all over these tents, Lord. We want to bring you home. Danny and Chase, bring them home. Yeah, bring them home, Bristos. Bring them, bring them home. I pray from the top to the back to the front to the sides. Lord, let us be a church. Let us be a people that bring you, we bring you into every space of our business every space of our family, every ministerial space, I pray that we bring you home. Like Mary, like Joseph, you're coming back with us. You're coming back with us. How many want God to go with you this year? 
in a way that you've never seen before. Who wants to get closer to God than you've ever been? Come on, just lift your hands all over the tents. Father, I pray right now that you'd meet us right where we are. Yeah. I got to do this first. I'm sorry. Just put your hands down real quick. If you're here today, I feel like the Lord just wanted me to start with this. We'll pray for healings. We'll be about finished up. You're here today, and you know that you haven't been walking with God and for God. You know in your heart that you, to be honest, maybe you used to have a relationship with him. Somewhere along the way, you left him in church. And today you're back in church, and today's the day you bring him home with you. If you need to rededicate your life to God today, this is the day. Your heart's speeding up right now. You feel like I'm speaking directly to you. There's several of you even online right now that God's dealing with. But if you're in the tents, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm not going to embarrass you, but I do feel a, I just feel an anointing today, man. If you're here and you go, Mark, I want to I wanna give my life back to God, or for the first time, I want to surrender to His goodness. If that's you all over the tents and online, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand on the count of three. One, all over the tents. Lord, I pray everyone that needs to respond, they would not miss this moment. Two, I pray right now. Hands start going up. Eyes closed, heads bowed. That's me. Three, I'm going to bring God home today. 2022, I'm starting the year with Jesus. Real high. Three, yeah, real high, real high, real high. One, two, three, four, five, six, real high. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Real high, real high, real high. Fourteen, real high. Yeah, I see fifteen. Anybody else? Anybody else? Fifteen. I don't know if I counted in the very back. Sixteen. Awesome. The front, seventeen. So good. Seventeen. At least 17. Online, I believe it's at least three online. Listen to me today, Ocean's Church. I don't know what it is, but I just feel, I feel something. We're doing good on time today. I just, forgive me, call me old-fashioned. I'm old school sometimes. I'm the, I'm the youngest old school preacher you're going to hear. But I just feel so strong even right now that there's something about coming out of your seats. And you're here today. Maybe you just raised your hand. And maybe some of you just, you go, Mark, I, I love them, but I just haven't been on fire. I've kind of gotten a little bit just apathetic in my walk with God. Would you pray like David that God will restore the joy of when I first believed? If you want something new this year in your walk with God, I'm just going to ask you to sing one last song. And you don't have to come all the way. To, some of you can come to the front. But others, you just take like a couple steps. Fill the aisleways. Just take a step out of your... There's something about taking a physical step that just is a prophetic declaration. I'm not staying. I'm not staying where I was. Is that all right? So we're going to sing one last song. If that's you today, I'm going to want to take a, a step towards God. Come on, step past where you've been before. Break some barriers in your faith this year. Go ahead, come on. Everybody just take a step of faith. Come on, step forward, step to the side. We're we'll just kind of shuffle a little bit. Shuffle, come on. We're going to sing one last song. We're going to pray for healing. We'll be out of here. Yeah, yeah. Come on, let's sing this. Come on, let's go after it. First Sunday of the year.
forgiveness. Wash in your mind, wash in your heart. New year, new beginning. How I love touch God's heart and I'm telling you when he touched the father's heart it says that healing is the children's bread I believe there's healing that's taking place I feel this power here to heal if you need a physical healing in your body I believe it's physical I believe there's even addictions that God wants to break off today if you need a, if, a an area of freedom from bondage or an area of healing in your mind or your physical body I would ask you to be bold I'm not the smartest guy, but I know when God shows up, He's here to heal. He's going to heal His kids. Would you just be bold enough to lift to raise your hand if you need to break through in an area or healing? Come on, doesn't make you weird. It makes you honest. Hands up all over. I believe from the back of the tents. I don't know why, but Suzette, I just saw God healing your back today. I see God healing organs in your body, even that have been damaged, even like a couple like soft tissue places. I pray in Jesus' name, from the back of the tents to the front. If your hands are up right now, would you just put your hand on someone that's next to you that has their hand up? If your hand's not up, put your hands. Come on, we're family here. Put your hand up. Come on, God's healing. The Bible says that we would lay hands on the sick, on those that need a, a, a miracle or a breakthrough. And the Bible promises that they would recover. So we put our hands on those today and we say in Jesus' name. Help me out, Ocean's Church. In Jesus' name. Come on, say it one more time. In Jesus name, Jesus name, we believe that you're healing, you're restoring, you're redeeming, and you're delivering right here, right now. We pray from the top of their heads to the soles of their feet, their mind, their will, their emotions, that today you would heal. Holy Spirit, fill them. Fill them. Yeah, right now, feel him. Right now, he's healing. He's healing. Someone that was abused growing up, ages 13 to 17, God's healing. Yeah. Someone stuck at like nine years old from when that traumatic thing happened to you. You're 19, you're 29 now. God's healing you right now. Is even someone here today, I feel like you have like some sort of crazy PTSD, unusual case from even the war, from military, and God's healing your PTSD today. I pray for Lord those that are bipolar, those that are schizophrenic. I pray for those with mental illness. I pray in Jesus' name that spirit of depression, we command you to loose your grip over God's sons and God's daughters today. They're not, they're not here on accident. They are made by God and for God to live with God. They have a purpose and a plan. It's a good plan. In Jesus' name, pray all over these tents today. Power to heal. Power to heal. Yeah, I feel His presence. But like us, we, we're a little over, but I want to just do this as we get ready to wrap up. Some of you today, you've never been water baptized. And I just feel like this is a monumental beginning to a new year, new chapter of life. That today's the day you need to get water baptized. The devil's given you 14 excuses of why you shouldn't. But God has one good excuse, that obedience is better than sacrifice. So let's do it today. If you want your family to see it, you can video it. You can send it to them afterwards. We have technology now. But if you need to get water baptized today, you need to get rebaptized. Someone got baptized when you were little or young, it didn't mean anything to you. And you want to get baptized declaring, I know what it means, and I want to identify in the death of Jesus, the burial of Jesus, and his resurrection power. I want him to make all things new. I'm almost done. If that's you today and you feel like you need to get baptized or rebaptized, would you just pop your hand up all over real quick? Spontaneous. We got clothes for you, towels. Just pop your hand up. Yeah, I see some hands going up right now. Awesome. Hands real high, real high. That's me. Do me a favor. Look at your neighbor. This is crazy how it works. Look at your neighbor real fast and say, do you want to get baptized today? They say yes. My friend Bruce the Baptist is over here. Bruce and Tammy. Raise your hands, Bruce and Tammy. Right here, right here. If you can, you go get go with them right now if you want to get water baptized. Go ahead. Give them a hand clap if you're getting baptized right now. The rest of you guys, 
Go ahead. And uh, we can't get her going out right now. Love, go ahead. Go over, go over. Yeah, it's awesome. Come on, give one more hand clap. People are going right now. You can hang out. We got time. It's not even one o'clock yet. Nothing today is going to be better than what's happening right here. Awesome. They're going out right now. A ton of people get baptized. I love it. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. A lot of people get baptized. That's awesome. Go ahead. Grab a seat. The rest of you. We have a couple closing announcements. We're going to seal this time. But listen to me. Make every Sunday in January a priority to be in God's house. Something special is going to happen every week.